Hi, I'm Serena Farb, and we are here um, talking with Aaron Wiesner today, turning things around a little bit. Usually he's the one uh, interviewing, and today I'm going to try and share his wisdom with all of you. So uh, Aaron, what, you, you put out these videos, you've been interviewing a lot of people, you clearly have passions for creating some sort of impact in the world. What is that impact? What, what is it that you're trying to do and what is your mission right now? My mission is just to save the world. That's pretty much it. In what way? Like, tell me what saving the world means to you. Saving the world means that uh, in the future, the future is going to be better than it is now. Okay, so what does better mean? What, what don't you like about the way things are right now? Ah, I don't like the way things are going right now. And it's not just me, it's a lot of people don't like the way things are going right now. What about how things are going? Can you give me some details? Well, at the moment, this is uh, May the 22nd, 2020, and we're currently experiencing a once in a lifetime economic event. And most people don't have a clue about the likelihoods of where it's gonna end up. And what, what, tell us a little bit more about the root causes. What is driving this economic event? Ah, so that is tricky. And this has taken me a while and that's why I've had so many guests on my calls. And I've been working on this for about 15 years. Um, other people understand this stuff from a different perspective than I do. Um, and so they're able to explain it from a different angle, but it has a lot to do with um, a mindset of, I mean, this is what it boils down to. It's a mindset of um, everybody being part of a person's community. So every, every, not just a person's family, but everyone and caring for everyone and loving everyone and trying to help everyone and serve everyone, just like um, any Aboriginal group would do. So if you're in a tribe of, or a band of say 50 people or 100 people or 150 people, anywhere, anywhere back in time, all the way to the origins of um, groups of primates being together, that was a very, very altruistic time. So, and humans evolved through that and even though they have um, a selfish instinct, of course, which is genetically coded, chemically coded, they have an even stronger altruistic, compassionate side. And, um, but at the moment, we have a gun again for the, I don't know, 20th or 30th or 40th time got to a point where uh, it, it, the number of people on the, the belief that everybody is inherently loving um, has come up against the ones that believe no, we're inherently selfish. But that's really the root cause. So I don't know if the root cause is helpful at this point. So you feel like the root cause is really human nature and this conflict between whether we are altruistic or selfish. Well, the root cause is a misunderstanding of human nature. So humans are compassionate by nature. They are more compassionate by far than they are selfish. Um, but the systems that we are, we exist within, um, society, culture, the, this economic system, is not structured around compassion and giving. It's structured around having things, having property and taking and accumulating or storing things. For example, all the books I've stored, all the things I've accumulated, all the things many people have accumulated. And that is a fundamental difference and it leads to um, inevitable instability in society. 
uh, economic instability and every, every kind of instability, more or less. Okay, so then my next question is sort of about economic philosophy. Um, sure. It sounds to me like what you're saying is that cap capitalism is a system built on accumulating wealth, capital, taking, exploiting. So are you saying that you like some form of socialism or even communism, or are you talking about something even different than that? I don't know if uh, a socialist system or a communist system as, they've, as we've seen them throughout history is entirely different from capitalism because people still are taught as babies, as toddlers, as little children, that there is such a thing called property and that property belongs to a person. It's a thing belongs to a person rather than that we belong to each other and that things don't belong to anyone. Um, so even in what people would typically think of as, as a, a, a country that has a communist background or a socialist background, so I'm thinking of as, as communist like um, China is normally thought of it that way, socialist, maybe France or, you know, a con con country like that, there's still the belief in property that people own stuff and it's okay to accumulate stuff. And there's nothing wrong with accumulating stuff. And in fact, that's the goal is to accumulate stuff to have more stuff. And that's the belief that I came out of school with that to be successful in life, if I was a millionaire, that would mean I was successful because I had accumulated enough to show that I was successful. And I would have my camper and I would have my house and I'd have my other house and I'd have my, my boat and my cars and all these things. And maybe I'd be a 10 millionaire or a hundred millionaire or whatever. And that that was the, that was the goal. You know, the goal wasn't um, to serve other people, to help other people, to be communal with other people, to have fun with other people, like was natural, like we evolved through for at least a million years prior to whatever, whenever things changed to this property mentality. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not sure if it really depends on entire, I don't know if it entirely depends on the economic system, whether it's called capitalism, socialism, or communism. I mean, there is a difference between them. I just don't think it's, I mean, as long as property is still part of it, I'm not sure that it, it's totally different. Okay. So sounds like you're advocating for a, a civilization society where people don't own stuff. So what does that, how do we create a society like that? What does that look like to you um, where, where we're not all about stuff and property? Well, actually this is kind of the big surprise because in many places we're already headed in that direction and many people are already in that position. For example, I was watching an interview today with um, Amy Goodman of um, Democracy Now! And she was talking with an uh, independent newspaper reporter in India. He was explaining that there are 20 or 30 or 40 million people who are now out of work because of this big reaction to this virus that um, is, is going around the world. and and these people are people who are desperately poor. So they have come from the country where they have nothing really. They come into the city and they do day labor work or whatever. Um, so maybe they sweep the streets or maybe they, they sell food or maybe they you know, wash windows. I, I don't know exactly what these folks do, but there's millions and millions of them, like 30 million of them. So they basically have nothing anyway at this moment. Um, and they have so little, in fact, they don't even have freedom. So they're only allowed to move about between seven in the morning and seven in the evening. They can't move about in the, at night, which is the cool time of the day. So they're forced to move about during the hot time of the day. So if they're trying to walk home- Just to stop, that, 
right now because of like curfews because of the pandemic or in general? Yes. Yes. Okay. I mean, we could generalize it to in general, there are people who have basically nothing. I mean, we know of these people. We've seen people um, in poverty stricken parts of the world where they have basically nothing. They might have a bit of shelter that they share with their family. That might be a bit it. Okay. And I don't necessarily consider that to be property, just having, you know, a little, a few rooms to live in. Um, and I, I don't, I don't consider, you know, having a, a, a few dishes and, you know, just the, just the, the basics that a person would need to go about daily life. Um, I mean, to a certain extent it is, if you look back at, imagine tribal plain culture, like, um, oh, I, I, I don't want to misname the, the, the Plains Indians, uh, see already the na native people, the first people of the United States, of this land, um, but they were communal. They were family oriented. So they would have their, their from birth to death, they would be with their family. They would be with their family. Um, they would grow up, they'd learn from their siblings, their cousins, their, their cousins, cousins, and they would learn from their, their, their olders and their youngers, and they would, they would go, they would learn everything they needed to learn to know where food was, know what time of year we move from Northern to Southern Michigan, know how to, you know, in the summer, we are gonna, we're gonna plant some seeds um, and we're gonna, that's gonna come up in, in the fall and we're gonna, you know, have fruit prior to that and fruit nuts and stuff. And then when that comes up, we're gonna have that and then we're, we're gonna move south and we're, so, and they were all communal, right? And there's still people that live this way, like in um, Sentinel Island off of India, in Northern New Guinea, in the Amazon. Um, now I'm not necessarily saying that we're gonna end up like that because obviously we live in a totally different world than they do. We already have all this built stuff. And so we're gonna be living with this built stuff, but it's really the mentality of, um, holding on to stuff and holding on to it so tightly that we are e either either willing to use force to keep it, violence to keep it, or that we're willing to call someone to come do violence for us so that we can keep whatever thing we have that is in abundance, like huge abundance, okay? I mean, you can see all the books behind me, for example. Do I need all those books here? Absolutely not. I don't need any of those books here because I haven't actually read any of them recently. So these could easily be communal. I mean, I don't mind if people borrow these who are neighbors and stuff. And a lot of them, I don't borrow, mind if they come back. What I don't want to see people doing is burning them. You know, I don't want to see people misusing them. Um, but I'm going on too long. You're good. So, okay. So that's very interesting. Um, Thanks. but I want to push you a little bit more, um, sure. cause you mentioned that obviously we have this stuff and we live in this world, so we can't live like some of these people that you mentioned in other places. So Certainly. what do you envision? Like you mentioned at the beginning that there's a big economic event coming. Um, here it's here. We're in that. Okay. So tell me what you see what you think our current path is taking us towards and what you would like to see people or society doing differently um, in this society right here, right now, not you know people um, living in New Guinea or something. Right. Well, and a lot of this is not necessarily my thinking and my work. I mean, the reason that I held five international conferences year after year to discuss these matters back in 2007, 2006 through 2011, recorded all that stuff, put most of it on YouTube on this channel. And then the reason I've been interviewing people for the past couple of months and putting it all on this channel, mostly live actually, most of the time, is because I'm trying to understand what's going on. And, and they are the ones who are helping me to understand and not just me, but others to other, understand what's going on. So it's not it's all, not like all this original thought. I mean, I'm I'm just bringing together thoughts that other people have. Um, 
but what was your question? So what do you see our current trajectory is right now? And what yeah. would you like to see individuals and or us collectively as a society doing differently? Well, ultimately I have a few personal goals. So one of my personal goals is I'd really like, I have two sons, um, one is 10 and one is 12. And I'd like to have them have a very nice life, a positive life. I'd like them to be able to have families and their families to be able to have families. I would like the same for myself. I'd like to have a good life, not necessarily this life, but a good life from now until, you know, I become part of the world again. And, um, you know, I have certain goals of like seeing people and hanging out with them and being close to them. Um, and in order for that to happen, things have to kind of hold together in, in a certain way or another. And I think there's a couple of different ways it could hold together, but there's also a number of ways where it might not hold together so well. And those types of goals might not be as achievable. So from a personal perspective, my, my, my goal is for my family, but a lot of times I feel kind of just a general sense of altruism towards everybody. And when I say everybody, I'm not just talking about human people, I'm talking about all people. So the, the people, the animal people that are in factory farms and feedlots and everything, and the, 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 the animal people and plant people, so to speak, again, other people's words that are subject to civilization as it is. For example, this morning I was looking at the Amazon on Google Earth. And I was like, wow, there's this weird spot in the middle of the Amazon. It doesn't look like it's forested. And I zoomed in and I zoomed in and I zoomed in and right in the middle of the Amazon, about the size of a country in kind of this round, roundish shape, all the trees have been cut. And then you zoom over to the east a bit, a, a bit east and a bit, a bit south, about a third of the size of that, another spot, boom, all the trees have been cut. And why are they been cut? Well, number one, the wood can be sold into the global economy. Number two, that land can be put to use for either growing, raising cattle, which are used for primarily meat, which is sold into the global economy, or it can be used to grow sugar cane to make sugar, which is sold into the global economy, or it can be planted with like um, palm that's made into palm oil and then it sold into the global economy. So I don't think I answered your question. I know I was going someplace with that. You care about all beings. Right, and so it's even, even those there, the ones that are being impacted, right? Because there's no particular reason that our homo sapiens species needs to be taking over the entire world. And it's, it's none of our faults. It's really a, tra a tragedy of, of the commons where no one is really individually responsible for the destruction of the rainforest, for example, or the destructions of ecosystems or the pollution of the oceans. But collectively, because of this mind, this, this, um, this mindset, this mental construct about owning stuff, having stuff, possessing stuff, holding on to it, storing it, keeping it, keeping everyone else away from it, collecting it, you know, that and, and accumulating, 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 like we are a non-social organism, but we are a social organism. We evolved that way in bands for like a million years. And that's the only way we were successful. We're not, I mean, some animals, they are not social like that. They don't, they don't stay together as bands their entire life. I mean, they're, they're, they're very solitary. In fact, predators do that. So if you think of um, snowy leopards or something, snowy leopards don't just hang together in a big bunch of 50 of them because that doesn't make sense as far as going out and getting food, right? There'd be too, too much competition. So they've evolved in a different path. They'll come together to mate and have, have a brood and then they'll separate. I mean, the same thing with like the polar bears. They come together to mate, they have the brood, and then the, 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 the father stays around maybe for a little while, but then they separate. And so in carnivores in particular, it's a different sort of thing. But in our case, 
we evolved as social organisms and we are altruistic by nature, like inherently. I mean, if you just think of uh, a mother who's just had a child, she's going to give that child what the child needs, no matter what. There's, it's instinctual. It's not a choice. It's not like she's deciding, oh, I'm going to feed the baby. I'm going to pick mm -hmm. up the baby. It's not a choice. So, um, and so the altruistic genes are dominant almost all the time, except when like the mother is like, I mean, she, she's got to get some water, you know, she's got to get some food. And that's when the selfishness takes over long enough for her to, you know, make sure she's not starving anymore. And then she goes back to being altruistic again. And this is basically the same with all humans. And there's always kind of this, this competition within oneself. But for most people, we're, we're well fed, at least in, in uh, the United States. Now, when we're talking about another country like India and all these people right now, who right now have, they have no freedom of a movement. Uh, if they do try to move, they're being, they're being beaten. Um, they're not being given food, even though there's food in the granaries, like millions of bushels of grain. They're not being given water even they don't have any money, so they can't send it home as like a remittance to their family. And I mean, that, this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg of the predicament that we as humans find ourselves in at this moment in time. And it's, it's, because, of, it's because of this whole mindset that we own stuff. And we are, as Daniel Quinn would take it, the takers. And we take stuff and we keep stuff. Whereas, um, whereas our heritage is being leavers. And so here's a story I like, to, I like to think of. Suppose you go on a hike, Serena. You go on a hike and you're with a group of people and you're like, oh, we're going up a, a slope and you see a stick and you're like, hey, that stick would be good for a walking stick. And you grab the stick, break off a few branches, test it out, good. You use it for a couple miles. You're done with the stick. You set the stick down. The next person picks it up. They use it for a while. They set it down. So yeah, you, while you're holding on to it, it's it's yours while you're holding on to it. But then you put it down because you don't need it anymore, right? It's not like you're going to take home a stick every single time and you're going to storm up on a shelf and you're going to say, "Here's all my walking sticks." I mean that that's the other mentality, um, and as it, it extends to everything. So, okay, no, very interesting. Um, but let's talk practically, because it sounds sure. like what you're saying is, you know, we need a different mentality. And that we need, I- we need, to, we need to recognize who we are as human beings and what our actual heritage is, which is compassionate, loving, giving, sharing, helping, um, reaching out, touching, you know. So if, if you think of think of the other great apes and how they live, mm -hmm. very very communally. So you can think of the the gorillas, the lowland or the highland, or the bonobos or the chimps or the orangs or whoever you want to think of. Very 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 communal. Well, the orangs aren't quite as. I mean, well, they, they so go I, out quite I, a bit. Well, and I have to throw something out. There was. Um, I believe if I'm remembering this correctly, I think it was Jane Goodall that made yeah. observations that mm -hmm. there were actually some extremely aggressive um, males in the groups of monkeys, the-, of the Yes, but if we go into that, yes. that's gonna take us a very long time. Okay. And humans, are not, humans are not the same as pan troglodytes, okay? Which is chimpanzees, so- you know, our ancestors did not stay in the trees or under the trees. Our ancestors went out onto the plain and started eating grass seeds and mm -hmm. roots and tubers and things. And you've, you've probably talked to some other evolutionary scientists who have shared some of this information with you. So, and you know, we stood up tall, we have our opposable thumbs. Yep. Eventually we were able to, through some, some mutation, develop the ability to make utterances so well that we could have language like we have now. And so there are there many little traits that distinguish us from 
the rest of the great apes. But there are a lot of, not a lot of similarities, but you know, there, there are enough that we can at least kind of see, you know, I, I'm thinking about the, the, I usually think about the gorillas as far as like the, the highland gorillas and you've got the silver back and he's just laying around and he's protecting, he's keeping an eye out. And then there's everybody else that there are adults and the adolescents and the kids are crawling on him. And it's very, very communal, communal. Nobody's holding on to anything. I and mean, it's not like they have a pile of twigs over here that they're going to keep. They don't even keep the same bed night after night, you know? So, and I'm not saying that's the way humans are for that. I mean, I think you need to look at kind of the uncontacted people, the people have been recent, recently contacted, the people who are live, still living in the tribal way, the people who lived in this part of the world before our ancestors came here, um, the people who live outside at any point in time, outside of this mentality. And there's kind of a border between the, the, the true mentality, which is a giving, loving people, and this other mentality, which is a possessing, taking, owning mentality. Okay. You want to know practically, so you're going to have to pin me down on it. So, okay. Practically, what I'm asking is yeah. how do we create this different future that you seem to be advocating for? Is that individually you go around or with your YouTube videos one by one and you're like, oh, be a, you know, giver, not a taker. Here's what that looks like. And we, you know, you get rid of all your books. We, you know, each take these actions to limit our stuff or does it mean changing policy at the federal level? Does it mean getting rid of countries and borders? It, like, what is it that you actually think right here, right now needs to change? Well, getting rid of is kind of putting it in, in the opposite frame. It's kind of the I'm in control frame. And that's not the case at all. The case of the matter is, and if you look back at the videos that have been done prior to this on this channel and many other channels and many other websites and many other places like in financial places, um, there are people who have already figured this stuff out that the global economy such as it has been for our entire life is unlikely to continue in any sort of form that it has been in as we move into the future, a year from now, two years from now, three or four or five years from now. And okay, I don't know, we don't know the timing on that. That's, that's the tricky part. So I can't say like, hey, by 2025, we're all gonna be living in this way or that way. And it's gonna be very, it's gonna, it's gonna depend on exactly on where that person is. So how you're living five years from now, wherever you're at, is might be very different from the way I'm living here five years from now. So when you say the global economy as we know it, won't exist um are you you know like there's some people right now unlikely so very unlikely to very exist unlikely. i mean if, if we we're gonna say 20 years from now i'd be able to say it with a lot more confidence okay. but i mean i've heard this stuff before and when i heard this stuff before i was like okay i'll get ready and then it didn't happen mm -hmm. and but that but that was only like 12 years ago and now we're in the same not the same boat because that that we're still in the same boat. We just were able to get through the, the bumpy part for a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it was more or less like a, a, a small tsunami and we got over the tsunami because we were out far enough, but that was just the start. And this is not the oh. best technology anyway. Okay, so like some people might say, and, and I'm sure. not an expert in all the economic stuff, but um, you know, I see predictions right now. But you could be because you are extremely clever. <laughs> You're, you're way up there. So you could understand all this stuff just like people are starting to understand it. And that's, I mean, that's why I'm trying to talk to you. So maybe not just that you can understand it, but you know, whoever's watching can. Right. So, so like out. one of the things I've, I've seen a lot of recently is, you know, people are looking at the unemployment numbers right now in, with the situation we're in. They're saying, we're, you know, we're just at the beginning. This is going to, you know, even if everything ended right now, lockdown wise or whatever, people could go back to work like normal, that 
the damage has already been done sort of like like that that we can't just resume how things were without having to go through some sort of great depression again basically that i mean these are the predictions i'm seeing just in headlines and things i've seen you know unemployment is reaching great depression levels we're gonna be hitting that again but then the thought that comes up for me is okay well we had a great depression and we got through it so why do you think this might be different and say lead to the end as you you kind of suggested of this whole system rather than okay we have a depression and you know we just then continue on as normal well again i'm not sure and for anybody who's watching i mean if you you don't know me probably so you shouldn't pin anything on what i'm saying you should just see if it sounds reasonable enough to be curious to look other places like you can look to the interviews i've done or even if you don't look to the interviews look to those people and find an interview they've done with somebody else or a lecture they've done or a talk they've done or a paper they've written or a paper they've referred to that somebody else has written um are you familiar with um like ecology and like systems dynamics mm -hmm. and like how where you can have a population like field mice for example so you have field mice and they're in this field and they eat the grass and so let's say it's a year where there's a lot of grass available and so those field mice are able to go out they eat a lot a lot a lot of grass they um they have babies and the babies are growing up and they eat a lot a lot of grass but it's a year where it's just really really abundant okay so um the next year they're still living because they have a lifespan of a few years maybe but this year it's it's just not one of those years where it's quite as wet because last year was an anomaly right and so there the amount of food available is less and since the amount of food available or energy available to them is less um their population is going to decrease and so their population goes up one year and it goes down and it's going to go through this kind of cycle around what's called like the carrying capacity. And the carrying capacity actually goes up and down, but their population follows. So the carrying capacity was higher in year one, their population came up more in year two, but then in year two, the carrying capacity was a bit lower. So there's, there get, it's, it's, it's called, I think an equilibrium, but it's not, it's not like the population is constant. Um, and there's also predation. And so now you have the predators, uh, uh, birds of prey, raptors, for example, and the raptors are eating the field mice. So they, during the year where there's a lot of the, a lot of them available, especially when, when on year two, where some of the mice aren't able to find enough food, a lot of predation on the ones that are going slow, not getting back under the holes real quick, because they're out trying to find food for themselves and their families. And so the population of the birds of prey increases. Um, and so there's these, there's this, this, bouncing around i mean it, it's kind of make it, it's an equilibrium of a sort but it's very very dependent upon the environment itself and the energy that's available in the environment itself and that's that's i mean that's how much sun came down that's that's you know was there a bad storm that that destroyed the, the grass you know it's, it's very dependent on the environment humans are actually animals in the same way that mice are animals. I mean, we have like four limbs and heads and we're a whole lot bigger, but we act, our population is actually follows the amount of food. So the more food there is, of course, the more humans there can be. And as long as there's distribution to get that food to the people, the population will increase. The food supply though, is not based only on sun, and water and soil anymore though. It's based on three, uh, one more thing, and that is the energy of oil and coal that are used for agriculture. Now that energy is energy that was stored in the earth millions of years ago. So on the land, it was trees and things and the trees died and they were compressed and compressed and compressed and they became coal. On the ocean, it was like the, the blue-green algae 
And there were times when they were so abundant, but of course they die, they don't live forever, go down to the ocean floor, they compress, compress, compress. And then there's um, the rising and lowering of the continents or the seas, whatever you wanna think about it. And so now we have oil as well. So this is energy that's been stored for millions of years, safely, as some would put it, sequestering this carbon away from the atmosphere. But it's not an infinite thing. There's a certain amount of carbon and there's some that's super easy to get out. In fact, so easy in fact with oil in Pennsylvania, you basically, you're, you're trying to put down a water well and all of a sudden this black stuff comes shooting out and you're like, what happened? What did I do? And first you're like, oh man, this, this is gonna be able to replace whale oil. I mean, cause we can burn it in lamps and everything. That's pretty cool. And then uh, we know what happened from there that now, now we have our entire civilization runs on oil, coal, a little bit of nuclear, a little bit of wind and solar and biomass and natural gas, which is normally found with oil. Um, but those are non-renewable. I mean, they're, they're finite. And as they deplete, they become more and more difficult to find and it takes more energy to get them out of the ground. So at first it took no effort at all because it came up on its own, right? No effort to, no pumping necessary, nothing. You just had to scoop it up, you know, <laughs> put down a pan and you had your oil. And then, you know, you might need to boil it to extract it into the various molecules. Nowadays, to get oil, all the good oil that's been on the land has been burned or made into plastics or other things. Uh, uh, fertilizer, uh, ammonia fertilizer. Um, in the process of making ammonia fertilizer. So what are we left with? So we're left with things like the tar sands in Northern Canada, the oil sands in Venezuela, the offshore rigs that are in half a, half a mile of water um, out in the Gulf of Mexico or uh, in uh, north of uh, England, between the England and the mainland, or in a few places still, not so, not so bad in the Middle East, you know. So, but the amount of energy that it's taking to get that oil to us is increasing continuously every day. It's increasing. So, where is it? At one time, you put in one unit of energy to get a hundred back. That's pretty good return on your investment, right? It's declined down to one in ten, one in nine, one in eight, one and, and for some of these things like these, the fracking, it actually takes, if you don't talk about the dollars and the subsidies, subsidies because that's really confusing to, to actually figure it out that way. If you just figure out how much energy did it take to do all this work to get out this little, fra the, the amount that was fracked, it, it's actually, you're, you're spending more energy to get it out. Now that's not always a bad thing because suppose you have coal energy and what you really need is a liquid fuel. So you use coal energy to extract the oil and now, you know, cause you can't eat, you can convert coal to a liquid fuel but it's, it, that takes a huge amount of energy. So, um, but this is one of the major things. So just like the mice, our civilization um, requires or I should say it runs on, just like a human body, it runs on energy. And when that energy becomes less available, more less readily available, when it's harder to find the food, things happen. And so that's one of the major points that people have not really recognized. And so this that we're in now is different from in the past because there's not a new energy source for us to go to. Like back in the 1850s, when my great, great, great grandparents came to Michigan and helped to cut the, all the trees down and were able to use the trees to build houses and uh, cook and heat their homes. And they used all the 
that energy. In fact, there's only one small stand of uh, virgin, so to speak, trees in the lower peninsula of Michigan. But there's, there's a couple here and there that were preserved for whatever reason. I'm amazed that they were. But, um, but then along came oil, right? And when oil came around, wow, industrial revolution, you can use it for all these different things. You can make motors, you can make, you can make vehicles, you can run machinery. And this is, was like the real, the real bonanza. And it was wonderful right up until about 1970 when the exponential curve stopped being ex exponential. You know, growth curves in nature, they can't stay exponential. So they end up kind of curving flat and then if it's a depletable resource, a, a depletable thing, they end up going down. The downslope isn't always smooth though. It can be like this bumpy ride. So that, that's why this one most likely is different. Now I'm not guaranteeing that because again, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, a lot of us thought, hey, this is it. Mm -hmm. And even back in 73, 74, people were like, hey, this is it. So, but the evidence is showing and the people who are like keeping an eye on this, like the scientists are saying, we're in a situation right now that's not the same as before. So, okay, very interesting. Um, and the question I have though, well, a couple things come to mind. One is um, I have read that humans tend to have a penchant for predicting the apocalypse, whether that is, you know, so like mind Cassandra. What? We're cursed just like Cassandra, some of us. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, you know, it takes different forms. So, but I, I do always wonder, you know, is our, oh, this is it, this is it. Oh no, this is it. Is that some deeper psychological, like we like to just predict the end times or as you're saying, is this really it? Is the evidence really here now? And we're not just exaggerating. Um, but then the other question I have is, from what you just explained, it sounds like this actually has very little to do with like the pandemic right now. You're just talking about this from a perspective of resources and ecological limits on the planet. So how does, you know, um, the pandemic and our response to that fit in? Do you think that is accelerating a breakdown of our system or, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so two things. Are you familiar with um, eusocial animals like leafcutter ants, termites, um, bees, uh, naked mole rats, those types of animals? I'm familiar with them. Okay. Evolutionarily, over the past history, at least four times have a, a species evolved so that it became more than just individuals. If you look at the um, leafcutter ex ants, ex for example, they will live in a, an ant mound in the Amazon, for example, or, or in Belize or wherever you wanna go, that is a couple meters deep, a couple meters wide in each direction, tens of hundreds of thousands or millions of individuals. They act as a single organism. So they will have their largest females be the, like the guards that'll be on the outside. They'll have the slightly smaller ones go out and cut the leaves. They'll have slightly smaller ones carry the leaves back. They have slightly smaller ones that are inside that are tending this, this moss or something and the leaves are fed to this moss and then they all eat this little moss that's in there. And they have their queen, and the queen is the one that has the babies. And she is, uh, she has babies um, for many years. Like she, she lives many years, um, like 20 or 30 years or something. It's a really, really long time. But that ant mound behaves as if it's a single organism. So it's called a super organism. And the same is for like um, a beehive a large beehive, I would say, or a termite mound, a large termite mound, or the naked mole rats are another example. Well, I'm not saying humans are exactly like that, but their civilizations have a trait similar to that. 
And if you look at any collapse of civilization, ancient Maya, the Easter Island people, the Roman Empire, um, feudal Japan, I mean, there's numerous, the Anasazi, there's numerous examples. These civilizations, what they would do is they would figure out how to um, really organize themselves so that they could extract a lot from the environment. But they would also destroy the environment at the same time because they were consuming it faster than it had the ability to regenerate. So for example, in the ancient Maya, they were using the trees outwards from the pyramid cities. And that was destroying the ability of the farmland because it became less and less productive to grow food. And at some point, the society collapsed. So where, where would a person learn, read about this? Um, Jared Diamond, who wrote a book called Germs, Guns, and Steel, which I think was one of the ones up for a Pulitzer Prize, um, also wrote a book called The uh, uh, The Collapse of Complex Societies, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed. And then another author, uh, Professor uh, Joseph Tainter, wrote a book of a similar title, studying these ancient collapses. So collapse is kind of like when an organism dies, okay? So when you die, for example, or when I die, when anybody dies, kind of like that. Now there are differences though, because whereas when we die, all our cells in our body are dependent upon us, upon every bit of us to stay alive. And our, none of our cells are gonna survive more than you know a few hours or days after our bodies dies. There might be a couple hanger honors like red blood cells for a few days or something, but that's not the same with societies necessarily because societies, the people can kind of walk away. They're like, oh, well, I, I guess the, the pyramid city is not providing food anymore. I guess we're gonna go and live out in the woods and see if we can uh, make a living again. In a lot of cases, the city had expanded out and the people who are who are living in a normal way, uh, indigenous way, had only recently come into the, the, the civilization and so they were able to easily return. Um, in fact, Mel Gibson made a movie like this called Apocalypto, um, which was very, very interesting for its own reasons. But, um, so collapse of societies is very, very familiar. Let's take a recent example. The United Soviet Socialist Republic, the Soviet Union. They collapsed in 1991. Um, they collapsed to the point where they were no longer able to stay together as a single mega nation. They weren't able to maintain control over Cuba. They couldn't even send Cuba oil anymore. And at, the, at that time, since Cuba was kind of seen as a satellite state to the USSR, the United States was enforcing an embargo. So nobody could take anything to Cuba. Cuba couldn't sell anything to anybody else other than to Russia. It was their one connection to the global market. And I don't even know that Russia... Anyways, that, that, that gets in a lot more detail. So collapses happen. It's, it's, it's a historical thing. And if we look back into the history of of any place really, we find collapses of societies. Now that doesn't mean that everybody vanishes, but it also doesn't mean that you're gonna have a population that's the same size five years after the collapse than it was at the time of the collapse. Gotcha. No, it makes a lot of sense thinking about it as the individuals being separate from the civilization itself. So, my last, I guess, final question here, more on the moving forward side, is, again, what should we be doing now or what would you like to see happen to create this better world? To, so, so is that avoiding collapse or is that, you know, letting the collapse happen and building something new out of it? Is that you know, again, is that changing laws and policies right now? What is it that you, if you had one final message to tell everyone, 
what should people do or be thinking or planning for? Well, what people should be doing is they should be thinking that, hey, you know, Aaron is not the only one who I've heard this from. You know, there's other people who have been kind of mumbling this stuff. I mean, I saw a show once about, it was like these survivalists or preppers or something. Why, why were they doing that? Were they nuts? Um, and you got to ask yourself, why is it that the billionaires, most of them, have these, these, uh, these not necessarily bunkers, but compounds where back in January, a bunch of them left their companies. They were like, okay, it was good. I was the CEO, but I'm leaving. And they went off. And a lot of the people who are like really, really into understanding financial markets and economics, people who've listened to Joseph Tainter, people who've listened to Jared Diamond, people who understand the limits to growth that Dennis and Don, Donella Meadows wrote, um, people that understand the idea of oil depletion and um, oil is not the only thing that's depleting. I mean, just think about how coal has to be got nowadays. You have to dig down basically a half a mile and make this huge mine. Just think how much energy it takes to go down deeper and deeper. You've got to make this cone to keep going down. You've got to keep stripping the cone away and the cone gets bigger and bigger and the, just to get this down to this coal. And you have to you know, take the tops off mountains. You have to go underneath the ground and the coal seems maybe eight feet and you have to dig over and um, so it's not the only thing. Uh, lithium is another great example. Uh, lithium is, is not abundant enough that we could all have an electric power car for 7 billion of us. I mean, it's not even that much on the planet. Um, we'd have to like go into the Earth's core. But anyway, what should, what's the future for people? Well, number one, it's hopeful because we have survived, at least our ancestors, yours and mine, survived every single collapse that ever happened ever since our ancestors became part of civilization. And whether that was, whether that's defined as the advent of fire, whether that's defined as the advent of language, or most commonly the advent of settled life where you, the whole mind mentality takes over. And what do I mean by the mind mentality? Well, if you plant, all this grain and you're depending on it because it's really the best food source you have. And if you learn how to do food storage with the grain and you have a granary, just a simple granary. I mean, it's made out of dried mud and stuff and big enough for 10 or 12 people to be in there. You become dependent on that food. And what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna fence it. You're gonna take out the weeds. If anybody else comes like, uh, a deer or a horse or something, you're going to be like, nope, this is mine. This is ours. This is ours. This is not yours. So you start having property, as in land property, not just possessions, but property. Um, and that mentality spreads because it's effective, because there's so much abundance of food that now you can have three or four or five kids that live to adulthood and they, they take up the same practice farming. Um, and this is really the start of the agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago, not, not with oil or whatever, but then. Um, and the rest of our ancestors, the ones who were still just gathering, or maybe a little bit of hunting, or the ones that were herding, which probably happened earlier. Um, so there was those three groups. Um, that mentality ends up spreading. It spreads. You're writing me. I need to sh shorten it up. <laughs> um, oh, no, I wasn't. Okay. So, 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 where do we go from here? Well, think of it this way: I'm here on an acre and a half in Michigan. I've got a garden outside. What am I doing? I'm encouraging my family and my wife to put in a big garden, a really big garden, because what am I depending upon? For my life, I'm depending on the entire system working so well that the grocery stores stay stocked forever. No matter what happens to the global economy, no matter how much energy is being consumed, no matter how much is left, no matter how easy it is to get, no matter how shocks there are to the system, no matter 
how much the issue is with money, which we didn't even get into, um, and debt. You know, at one time it was illegal to have student debt. That, you know, was I, that wasn't a thing. That. And now many people have student debt. At one time, it wasn't possible to make a loan for a house for more than half of the value of the house. And now people can make a, a loan for the whole value of the house, essentially. Um, at one time, you know, if you wanted a car, you had to save up for it. Now you can go in, no money down, no interest payments for a year, you know? So the amount of debt has went as high as it can go as well. And for those just looking at a curve, if it goes up and up and up, the change becomes when it's not accelerating up at the same rate. It's not exponential anymore, but it starts going around and it doesn't come down in the same nice smooth way as it's going up. So we have several things happening at the same time. We have the environment. On top of the environment, we have the energy that civilization is using. Civilization is like a super organism. On top of that, we have money, which is used to make stuff go where it needs to go. It, it, it's, it, it directs both that energy and our labor, both, and all the materials. But the money system has this whole interest component, and it, and it, so there's this 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 uh, incentive for it to grow larger and larger and larger and get more and more complex. So at this point, um, let's see things say things simplify. Let's say the IMF disappears, and the um, WTO disappears. Um, international trade starts to be stifled by different countries. Mm -hmm. Borders start to be kind of locked down. Um, so imagine if your body did that. Imagine if your heart said, no, we're gonna kind of lock down ourselves. And your brain said, yeah, I'm gonna lock myself down too. And then your mouth said, well, yeah, I'm gonna clamp down and I'm gonna take the nose with me. Okay, it doesn't necessarily work. You gotta have, when you get to, when you have stability for so long, the whole system becomes super in, uh, fragile really because it's so complex i mean you got people that have such very particular jobs and they have to do them in such particular ways in particular places to keep everything going for example imagine an automobile how many parts do you need to make an automobile and how many are th those parts get there just in time maybe ten thousand parts different parts different shapes different manufacturers all over the globe to make this one car plus the labor plus the plus the capital extremely complex now, you have a shock where, hey, everybody stay home for a month or two, unless you're essential. What is the likelihood that you're just going to be able to say, oh, everything is still in place. There wasn't any mistakes. Everything that was essential for us to start up again is still in place. So now you're thinking about probabilities. What's the probability that we're going to get back to the where we were? Well, every day, every single day, it's looking less and less not just for you and me, but for people in other countries, like in India, mm -hmm. it's looking less and less a whole lot, even more every day. And India is not even the, 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 the worst example of this. Um, what are the odds that we're gonna go to a new state, like a totally different state, this super organized state to a simpler state, like stepping down a level. So now we don't have this world trade, but we still have national trade. Well, is that gonna be able to hold together? Is the federal government be able to going to be able to keep paying people to buy stuff when there's nothing there's nothing to buy other than food because nobody's making anything and we're not importing anything? Okay, well, what if the national government collapses like it did in the Soviet Union? Well, now we're down to the states. Mm -hmm. Now, which states have the capability to make sure that everybody's fed? because we have a lot of imports and not just imports of food. We also have imports of what, what does it take to grow food? You know, the, the oil and the electricity and the parts and the fertilizers and the, 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 the GMO seeds and all those inputs. Are we going to be able to get that if, if the system starts simplifying or collapsing down? And there's like five levels of collapsing down. Um, Dmitry Orlov 
was in the Soviet Union at the time it collapsed, or he, he had left just prior to it. And so he studied this, wrote a whole book called um, The Five Stages of Collapse, Dmitry Orlov. And he's been on the internet a lot recently, like he's giving a lot of interviews. In fact, he was in the US for a couple decades and then he got out of Dodge because he's like, oh my gosh, the United States is in the worst position right now for collapse because it's so overextended. There's so much debt. Um, it's so dependent on energy from other places and trying to get energy out of these fracking wells where you're put, spending more energy than what you're getting out. Um, so he's back in Russia now. Um, so, so what should people be doing? Well, people should be thinking, if the grocery stores are gonna be empty, which is a possibility, let's say it's only one chance in a hundred. Well, say there's a one chance in a hundred that this house is gonna burn down tonight. Oh my gosh, you know, that's a big deal. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay up all night. What if there's a chance one in a hundred that's gonna burn down this year? Well, I'm gonna do a lot of drills. I'm gonna prepare. I'm gonna make sure that, you know, I've got my pictures and files backed up. I'm gonna make sure I have insurance. So if the house burns down, I, I have money so I can buy a new house, you know? So, so even if it's only one in a hundred, what should you be doing? Well, you got a lot of time, a lot of us. Get outside and grow a garden, a garden that grows food, not flowers, food, lots of food, as, I'm, as in calories, lots of calories. And don't just like necessarily do an old, same old garden. You know, you can put fruit trees and nut trees. You can do multi-layer organic, try, try to use, you know, seeds, organic seeds, uh, heritage her heirloom seeds that will actually, you can take the seeds when, when the, the, the new seeds are ripe and you can save them for next year. And what else can you do? Well, as greedy as this might sound, you could increase the size of your pantry. So instead of having a weeks of food, which is a lot for some people, you could increase that to two weeks or four weeks or a month or two, or two, mo two months. Um, that's really short term though, right? Because you know, are you going to teach a man to fish? Are you, are you, are you going to give a man a fish or are you going to teach a man to fish? And which is going to serve him right uh, for the rest of his life? Um, and also, of course, if people start storing up, storing up, that just kind of accelerates the point at which the stores might become empty. I mean, they're already empty of some things, right? Um, mm -hmm. Flour, for example, sugar, um, certain staples toilet paper, which is kind of a weird one, but it just points out how the system is not, it's, it doesn't respond quickly to big changes, as in the restaurants are no longer have food. It's not just easy to say, oh, we're gonna package it for, for grocery stores now. It's, it, it doesn't turn on a dime. It's, it, it's very, very non, it's not anti-fragile is what the term is. And Nassim uh, Talib, I think, wrote a book on anti-fragility. Um, so what else can you be doing? Well, to have food in a garden, you need to have water, right? Let's say there's one in 100 chance that the electricity grid goes down. Other countries, it's went down, right? I mean, you might not be familiar, familiar with it, but they, it'll go down for days at a time. Mm -hmm. How are you gonna get water to your, to your plants? Maybe you're not living in the right place. Are you living in a place where you can grow food or not? I mean, can you grow enough that you can be like, Let's just say you had a goal of being able to feed your whole family three years from now on your little plot, on your yard, suburban yard, whatever it is. I mean, are you in a place where you could do that? Um, maybe you're not in a great place. If you have a condo or an apartment and a high rise, I would say might not be the best place to live because if people are hungry, what's the likelihood the farmers are gonna keep sending the food to the cities rather than keep it in their small communities? So there's gonna be a lot of, there are already a lot of people who are buying places like right now today, they're buying places out in the, away from the city. You went, not everybody would know that, but if you live out in the country, you start to hear things and you start to see things. There's not a lot of houses for sale. People are actually buying up those houses. You wouldn't think they are. But at the same time, the housing market has already went down. If you were to sell a house like a typical house in the US right now, it'll sell for the same price as it sold six years ago. The price went up and then in the last few months it's come way down. Um, what else can you do? Well, 
security. You know, some people are worried about, well, what if somebody comes and takes my food or something? Well, your neighbor, your best friend, who you you give stuff all the time, who you you give time, you know, you, you tutor their kid, you go over, you give them bread when you make bread, you give them a nice hot loaf, you know, you spend have some laughs together. If they need something, you give them something. If, if you need something, you, you take something. Um, actually, your real life physical neighbors, like the people that actually are closest to you, whether it's 50 meters or 100 meters or whatever, getting to know them and not worrying about, oh, you're such and such. Oh man, you're, you're, you're a socialist and you're, you're a, a communist and you're, you're a Democrat and you're Republican and you're green and you're, you're whatever. That's not relevant to the fact that you guys are in this together, you and your neighbors, because your neighbors, I mean, you want your neighbors to be doing the same thing. And if they're not doing the same thing yet, invite them over, show what you're doing. Say, hey, you know, we're putting together a big garden. You know, I'm kind of worried about, and you remember back in World War II, everybody was asked to grow a garden. They were called victory gardens and everybody grew big gardens. And actually about half of the food in the nation was grown in gardens because the other half of the food was going to Europe to feed the soldiers, not just our soldiers, but other soldiers. Um, so what else can you do? You can just think about, well, do you really want to just wait and see, or do you want to do some things that you have time for anyway? I mean, and getting outside is great. Um, you might want to consider, hey, mom and dad live somewhere else, but they have more acreage hey, maybe I'm gonna live there as well. We'll all live there together. That would be going back to kind of the way it always had been and how the way it is in many other countries where multifamily, at least three generations are within a household. I mean, that's very common. In fact, um, actually two houses now are three family, uh, three generation houses. They weren't three months ago. Wow. Uh, grandma moved in in both of them because grandma was, you know, well, what about if I have my pension and stuff? Well, you know, money will be fine, right? What about my 401k? You know, I'm putting away stuff. What about the banks? The banks will be okay, right? Well, what if the electricity goes down? Are the ATMs gonna work? Are the credit cards gonna work? Do you have any cash? How much cash do you have? Do you have any coins? I mean, how are you gonna buy stuff? You're gonna rely on your credit card? Absolutely, like your, your life depends on it. And if, if the banks close, the banks, banks have closed before, or they'll have withdrawal limits. In other countries, they'll say, oh, you can draw withdraw $100 a day, but then there's a line to get to the ATM because you can't go inside. Tellers don't want you inside if you might be sick. So, I mean, these are the sorts of things. And for people that you just think about it, you know, how dependent are you upon this hyper complex, more complex than it has ever been in any point in history system that is that had by, by competition has been made super, super fragile because you have to do it at the cheapest cost, which means you have to do it in the way that you just barely are able to do it. Um, so, so where does that leave us? Well, suppose, suppose there was a collapse of a couple layers, international, national. You, you probably, you, if you've got food going on, you might be living with your neighbors and you might be kind of making a living with them as far as you're all growing food, you share with each other, you know, you help each other out. You know, I might, I might teach the kids, you might work on the roofs, you know, you might be the one that goes, finds the fuel for the winter. In fact, you've got a wood burning uh, fireplace. I don't, but you got a big house. You know, maybe I'm in your downstairs during the winter for a few months. I don't know. But you're gonna, it's gonna be the people around you. And hey, I haven't met those people over there because you know, they're a little, well, those are the people you gotta so, go see first and bring, a, bring some stuff and ask them, what do you need? Because your security, your security is based on your weakest network link amongst your neighbors, really. So, but this is how this giving comes back. This altruism comes back and it starts with an individual. The individual does it. This isn't where you're gonna call up the government and say, hey, we need everybody to be helping and growing gardens and stuff. No, this is something where you initiate it yourself. You go out, you do it, you help others do it. You invite others to do it. You share stuff on the Facebook, 
on the email, on the phone calls, on the Zooms, whatever, you try to share this message. Now, is there a possibility that we can keep on keeping everything? Well, there is. So this is the other future. Now this other future, we all get this message soon. We all decide, hey, I like some of the things I have. I like the internet. I like being able, being connected to people far away. I don't want to necessarily have to move. Well, that means, you know, wait a second. There is enough food for everybody because everybody's here. That means last year there was enough food. There's enough food. There's plenty of enough food for everybody in the world. It's a distribution issue, right? What if we use our intelligence, our internet, our skills to make sure the food is distributed, distributed equally, not just now, but we make sure that the people who are growing the food are given what they want. So they keep growing the food. That where the oil goes, the, the, the inputs, the inputs go where they need to be. Now this requires a lot of cooperation and coordination from where you are, from where I am, everybody working together on this goal, which is to make sure everybody's fed, make sure we keep the essentials in place, as in the water systems, the sanitation systems, the electric grid, um, whatever the essentials are. Hospitals, I wouldn't put in the essentials category, but the doctors I would, and the nurses. Um, the dentists, I don't know the orthodontists, a lot of people don't do orthodontics, but um, I mean, there's certain, certain folks that are gonna go in that group. Just, just imagine what were the careers 200 years ago? You know, those are probably the same careers that you're gonna be like, yeah, I want, I want a plumber around, I want an electrician. Um, so there is that possibility and there's even a name for it. It's called the global brain. So that's where we all work together using all our technology to coordinate to make sure that everybody's fed, everybody's in a place where they can not just give them a fish, but we show them where to go so that they, they can fish or that we go get them. We send a cruise ship and we say, hey, we got a place where they'll grow a lot of food. We're gonna send a cruise ship for you guys. Do you wanna come? You can have this land. You can have two acres for fam per family. We can bring you here. Now this is really out of the box thinking, right? This is not the thinking that is around in the world right now because hey that's property that's my property that's our property that's our country we can't bring other people into our country this is our land we have borders and and yeah but that's where the food is why do you want to have to transport the food all the way from here to there when you could just bring them here they can still grow the food they can put their organic gardens and their apple trees and their fig trees and everything up I mean, you can bring, instead of bringing the food to the people, you can bring the people to where they can grow their own food and then give them the ability to do that. This is not impossible, but it is, it does require a whole lot of coordination. And that's a different vision from allowing everything to collapse and not worrying about the people in India and the children and the babies and those in Yemen and those in Somalia, and those in so many places. I mean, this is a different vision. And some people are, are gonna say, well, that's not even possible. But we have the internet. We have the ability to make decisions in a collective way, a swarm mind, so, so to speak, uh, a global consciousness. Um, you could even go as far as to say, Gaia has become conscious, Earth. We, we have built, the, 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 the brain, the neural system of the earth, the civilization has. Now, what are we gonna do with it? Are we just gonna let it collapse as well? Are we ever gonna be able to turn it back on? Would we be, be, even be able to do that? Um, we can certainly make it more efficient. I mean, it uses a lot of energy, especially Bitcoin, crazy. Um, what's gonna happen if the grid goes down and you have all these Bitcoins, <laughs> what are you gonna do with that? So. So there's some futures, there's a couple different futures. And depending on what future we choose, I think most of us are gonna make it. But, you know, it depends on place. The people in India right now, you know, some of them are not gonna make it. I mean, unless, unless someone with a lot of charisma gets up there and says, wait a second, the granaries, we're gonna set it up. 
You know, if you're in the military, here you go. You're gonna, we're gonna do food distributions and everything. We're gonna have kitchens, soup kitchens or whatever. We're gonna do, we're gonna do the same thing that Roosevelt did. We're gonna allow, we're gonna hire anybody. And all you have to do is you come to work. We're gonna feed you all day. In fact, and at the end of the day, we're gonna give you a bag, you go home, feed your family. You come back tomorrow, um, just like a, a civil conservation course. I mean, you, this is stuff that could be done. You don't even need money to do that. I mean, you just need to have a organized system and the internet, we could use the internet to do that, we could. Will we, that's the question. What, what, how do we wanna live? Do we wanna live connected? Do we wanna still have some of the things we have now? Or do we wanna be, you know, it'll still be okay, but I probably will never, never be able to come to see you <laughs> where you're at. And you probably will never be able to come and see me. But will we ever go to a conference together in person again? I don't know, I hope so. I hope we have at least one more summer. I hope so too. <laughs> Well, thank you. Very interesting, little disturbing to think about sometimes, but uh, yeah, thank you for sharing all of your thoughts and all the wisdom that you have collected and drawn on from people before you. And so what I would recommend, I have not written a book. My book is the YouTube channel, more or less. I mean, I do journal writing and I have a Facebook, but go and watch some of those other videos. Like um, if you really wanna feel it, watch Gail, the actuaries video from yesterday. And if you're really like academic, go watch um, David Korowitz's video about fragility. And if you wanna know about um, collapse, Joseph Tainter came to Michigan like 10 years ago and recorded his whole collapse lecture. He explained why societies get complex, why they simplify the whole energy component. And this goes back to just ecology, really. Because these curves that I'm talking about, you're kind of familiar with those. You're a science teacher, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, this is, like, this is like a real thing. So there, there's plenty of information out there. Um, I tried to compile both the, the reasons why you need to become aware and some of the solutions like look into the term permaculture transition towns relocalization um resilience look into what happened with cuba well what happened with cuba after they didn't have any oil for their tractors anymore and they didn't have any fertilizers well they had to all start growing food all of them in the cities everywhere vegetables another one same thing power of a community and a lot of times people will be like oh cuba they're a horrible communist nation or whatever well in this case they they came together they acted like a family they were able to figure it out <laughs> they used a lot of bicycles they didn't have a lot of cars they did a lot of growing of food you know they had to, they had really figured it out but they did figure it out so it was simpler though, right? They didn't have the tractors and everything. Yeah. Well, thank you. Very interesting conversation. Thank you, Serena. I appreciate your time. And for everybody who watched this, if you appreciated that we put this on the internet, and that's what it means. If you appreciated that this is on the internet, and that we uploaded it for you to watch, then please put a thumbs up. All that means is you appreciated, thank you. Thank you for putting this on the internet. Um, and if you have a comment or a question, put it down in the box. If you wanna hear more things like this, subscribe, You know, get notifications and share this information, converse with it. And don't take my word for it, be skeptical. Think for yourself, does this make sense? Why does it make sense? Look other places. All right, thank you.